This video is an introduction to small unmanned aerial system cybersecurity. The video is brought to you by the National Cybersecurity Training and Education Center. The creation of this video was funded by National Science Foundation Advanced Technological Education Grant. My name is Dr. Philip Kreger. I'm an Associate Professor of Cybersecurity at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. In this overview, we're going to define what a small unmanned aerial system is, and the more common terminology is drone. So thereafter, we're going to be using the term drone. We're going to discuss how drones are used in commerce and in government, describe a drone's components, but for the most part, we'll be talking about cyber threats to drones. So what is a drone? A drone is simply an unpiloted aircraft or spacecraft. And there's other terms that have been used instead of small unmanned aerial system or drone. And those include an unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV, unmanned aerial system, UAS, which is now the preferred term used by the Department of Defense. And a few years ago, drones that were used by the Department of Defense in combat were called unmanned combat aerial vehicles. So interestingly, drones have been in existence for a while, maybe not in their current format. For example, during World War I, there were radio-controlled Sopwith camels that were loaded with explosive. And if you don't know what a Sopwith camel looks like, this is what one looks like. So suffice to say that we've had unpiloted aircraft for quite a while. This is the Department of Defense Drone Survival Guide, and it shows the various drones and their sizes over the years. And if you notice the scaling over here, some of these are on the order of over 60 feet wide and 40 feet long. However, the Department of Defense has also used very small drones if you look down here at the bottom of the graphic. But for this discussion, we're not going to be talking about military drones. We're going to be talking about the little drone over here in the bottom right hand corner of the graphic, which is an AR Parrot drone which is a hobbyist drone that weighs less than five pounds. And so we're talking about drones that look like this. And these drones can be purchased from Amazon or from the manufacturer or Best Buy or anywhere that you can find electronics. So a few years ago, the Federal Aviation Administration predicted that there would be about 3.2 million consumer drones, or we call them hobbyist drones, and about 600,000 commercial drones operating in the U.S. by 2020. Well, as it turns out, they recently readjusted that number, and there's been about 7 million consumer or hobbyist drones in the U.S. So the growth of drones over the fat past few years has grown dramatically. So drones have been used by commerce, business, and government for quite a few years, and their use is growing. For example, for infrastructure monitoring, you see here we have telecommunications infrastructure, telephone lines. They've been used to monitor dams and even railways. They're also used in emergency management. Right now, the Department of Interior, as of 2020, has around 700 to 800 of these drones that are used for emergency purposes. They're also used in crop monitoring. And of course, we know they're used by law enforcement and they're used at the local level the state level as well as the federal level. In fact, the Border Patrol uses drones to patrol the border. They're used in geographic mapping of ruggedized terrain. They're used for building inspections. And of course, they're used in the military. So what components are found in a consumer drone? Well, common configurations include CPU and RAM, some type of communication system, either through Wi-Fi, or some other radio frequency, a camera for photography and video. We have some sort of data storage for files and an operating system. We have some types of sensors, and the most common of which is GPS. We have a battery. And of course, in order for the drone to fly, it needs aeronautical hardware, and it needs a controller for manual flight operations. If we strike out those last two components, what do we have? Essentially, we have a laptop or a smartphone. And so a drone is essentially 
a flying computer. And as such, we know that any computing device is potentially susceptible to cyber attacks. But there are a couple of caveats. First, drone manufacturers are constantly improving their technology. Also, consumer drones are very different from military drones. Military drones have extra protections. So what types of cyber threats exist for drones? We'll just look at a few hypothetical or seemingly hypothetical types of attacks. Now we know that a drone requires a controller just like a car requires a steering wheel and gas pedal and a brake pedal. So what if we were able to disconnect the controller from the drone? Now quite a few of the smaller drones are controlled via smartphone app that you can download and install on your Android or iPhone. Now what if we were able to disconnect the controller from the drone? It would be like trying to drive a car without a gas pedal or a brake pedal or a steering wheel. And you would essentially have this. But now you would have this object flying perhaps over people or over buildings. This may sound difficult requiring special hardware or software, but it's not. So this is a script called Drone Hole, and you can find this out on the internet. And while this may seem quite complex, I will walk you through the important parts. This script identifies two particular types of drones. The first is a DJI drone, and the second is a Parrot drone. DJI drones are Chinese manufactured drones, and they hold about 70% of the current market. Parrot drones are French drones, and they hold about 6 to 7% of the market. And so this script is able to identify a DJI or Parrot drone by their MAC address, and I'll explain what that is in just a minute. The script identifies either one of these drones. It then sends a hang-up packet, which essentially breaks the controller and drone connection link. So you're probably asking yourself, what is a MAC address? Citizens of the United States have uniquely identifying numbers. There are social security numbers. And like citizens of the United States, Every network-capable computing device also has a unique hardware address that's associated with its network card. So what do MAC addresses look like? They look something like this. If you look on the left-hand side of the graphic in the yellow, we see three hexadecimal numbers. Those hexadecimal numbers on the left indicate the vendor. And so DJI drones will have a set of similar hexadecimal numbers and Parrot will have a different set. But this goes for all computing devices, but you're able to identify the vendor from the first three characters. Now the second set on the right is the serial number for the drone. And these are going to be unique as well. So if we put together the vendor number and the serial number, we have a unique MAC address for every computing device, which includes drones. So now let's look at the script. So if we look up here in the top left-hand corner, we have a for statement. And what this is doing is, is that this is allowing this script to scan the network for wireless devices that are attached to it. Once it finds a device, it extracts that MAC address from the network traffic that is flowing through the network. Once it extracts that MAC address, it compares it to known DJI or Parrot drone MAC addresses. Once it identifies one of those drones, it then sends, as this is the command that essentially says, hang up the connection between the drone and the controller. So essentially, you've got this. The pilot who's controlling the drone no longer has control of the drone. And so this is called a de-authentication attack. And it's something that's only associated with Wi-Fi networks. And a lot of drones, especially some of the cheaper drones, will only use the Wi-Fi protocol. So what happens when a controller is deauthenticated from the drone? What happens to the drone? Does the drone return to home? Now let me say a little bit about that. A lot of drones now are GPS capable. And so when the drone takes off, it will remember 
the geolocation, the latitude and longitude from where it took off. And some drones have the capability that if that controller link is lost, that they have the capability of returning from where they took off. However, not all drones have this capability. Some drones will gracefully ground themselves. That is, whenever they lose that link, they just return to the ground, no matter where that is. So there could be people under there, there could be houses, there's no telling where they're going to land. Some drones just might fall from the sky, and if there's people under there, they could be injured. Again, some of these drones can weigh up to five pounds. They could also fall from the sky and cause property damage. Or, if you have a particularly malicious threat actor, they could fall from the sky and the threat actor could steal the drone. So let's look at the next threat. And the next threat involves GPS. More and more drones are going to be GPS enabled. And so our first GPS attack is called spoofing. And see, here we have the setup where we have the controller on the bottom left-hand corner. We have the drone, and then we have the GPS satellite in the upper right-hand corner. Now, for civilians, we get to use one of four civilian bands. And there's, there's multiple bands on multiple frequencies that enable us to create or identify our geolocation. And that occurs through triangulation. That means that it takes more than one GPS satellite to indicate or to give to us a fairly accurate latitude and longitude location. Now, some of the things you need to know about the civilian bands. The first is, is that they're not authenticated. When a drone or if we're in a car or with our smartphones, if we're using our smartphones for geolocation, for example, Google Maps or Waze, we're assuming that we're getting an authentic GPS location from an authentic GPS satellite. The second issue is that these signals are not encrypted. That is, they're in the clear. A little later, we'll see why that can be an issue. And finally, these are fairly weak signals. And you'll see in a couple of slides why that can be an issue as well. So, what is GPS spoofing? Essentially, because this is a weak signal and there's no authentication, a bad actor can create a stronger signal that overrides the weak, authentic GPS signal and that spoofed signal has fake coordinates. And once that's picked up by the drone, it really doesn't know where it is. It has false geolocation information, which can be problematic if the controller is relying upon GPS data from the authentic GPS satellite signals. And this is not merely a theoretical attack. This is an article from April 14, 2019. And this alleges that Russians are modifying the GPS signals, sending bogus navigation data to thousands of ships. And so the story behind this is, if you look right here in the center, on the left of this triangle, this is the Black Sea, and it borders Russia. And so it's been alleged that the Russians are sending out these spoofed GPS signals, and in one case, it caused about 100 different ships that were located in the Black Sea to appear on their GPS screens to be several miles inland at an airport. And of course, you know that can't be correct. But nevertheless, this is an actual threat and is being used today. The second GPS threat is jamming. And this is a very old threat and it's been used in electronic warfare by militaries for dozens and dozens and dozens of years. And of course, they're still using it. So what's the issue here? Again, the issue is, is these GPS satellite signals are very weak. If a threat actor is able to create a stronger signal on the same frequency that is being used by the civilian GPS satellite, then the drone in this case is unable to receive that GPS information which means now that the drone essentially is flying blind, and if it's important that it needs geolocation information, well, it just doesn't have it. GPS spoofing and jamming are illegal in many countries, including the U.S., but you know that for a malicious actor, legalities seldom stop that behavior. This is an article from December 30th, 2019, 
it's been alleged that the Russians are jamming their communication signals, which would not only be GPS, it would be any communication signals used by U.S. fighters there flying around Iran. This is a drone. This is not a very good picture of a drone, but you see there's some writing down here that is definitely not in English. And what is this drone? Well, this turns out to be an RQ-170 Sentinel, which is a CIA drone that was being used in 2011. So it just so happens this drone was captured by Iranian hackers. And the government nor the CIA has ever described how this occurred. But I found online something from RT.com, which is supposed to be a Russian site, but I've found that sometimes that their information is quite good. But you can take that for what it's worth. But they spoke with a Russian engineer, and he said that he was responsible for the interception of the drone, and that he was able to hack into the craft's GPS navigation, which he said was weak, which of course means also the cybersecurity was weak. And to quote, he said, by putting noise or jamming on the communications, you force the bird into autopilot, and this is where the bird loses its brain, which then caused the drone to crash and then be intercepted by the Iranian government. So let's look at an example that's closer to home. So a few years ago, there were some University of Texas at Austin students who were doing some work with drones, and what they wanted to do is to test the drones that were being used by the U.S. Border Patrol down on the U.S.-Mexico border. And so Homeland Security uses these drones to make sure that if there were no illegal crossings or whether there was any drugs being smuggled in, and they went down to the border and they were able to scramble the drone's GPS signals and feed it false location data, that is GPS spoofing, to make it think it was somewhere where it wasn't. These threats I'm talking about, these tacks, while theoretical, they've actually been used in the real world. Now let's look at a man in the middle attack. So this is a very old attack and it's been around as long as there have been computers and networks. And the attack occurs when the attacker is able to get in between the sender and receiver, that is two computing devices on a particular network. A man in the middle attack can cause damage because it can, the man in the middle can modify communications, that is modify that traffic going between the senders and receivers. You can inject new communications, that is false traffic, or delete traffic that's going in between the sender and receiver. Now this is more easily accomplished when there's no encryption being used. And as we'll see in later videos, that that is often the case. So here's our normal setup where we have our user and we have a web server and there's traffic flowing to and from the user and the web server. A man in the middle attack looks something like this. Is that the man in the middle is able to now situate themselves in between the user and the web server. And so all the traffic going between the user and the web server is now accessible by the man in the middle, which means they can modify that traffic, they can inject false traffic, or they can delete traffic. Imagine with a drone. And so we have our pilot, and we have our drone, and then we have the man in the middle, which can modify, inject false, or delete traffic, which can then cause the loss of control of the drone. So let's combine a couple of these attacks. Let's combine that deauthentication attack and the man in the middle attack for a drone. So here we have our normal everyday setup on the right. We have our average person with their controller and they're flying their drone. And these drones we see here are the Parrot AR Drone 2s. On the left, we have our threat actor, our malicious adversary. They're controlling their drone. Except the drone on the left has been modified so it has the capability of listening to wireless signals nearby. And so once it finds that there's another AR Parrot drone, and recall how it would find that, it would identify it by that MAC address. Once it identifies that that's a Parrot drone, it sends that deauthentication hangup packet to the drone on the right, which means that that average person is no longer in control of that drone. Immediately, that drone sends an authenticate packet, which then authenticates the two drones, which means that now the malicious adversary, the bad actor, now controls his or her drone as well as the other drone. 
Now, this sounds silly, and it sounds very hypothetical, right? Well, someone has created the software in order to do this. And this program is called Skyjack. And it does essentially what I described previously. So once you have your bad actor drone install the necessary Skyjack software, it flies around and it seeks wireless signals of other drones. When it finds a paired AR drone, it deauthenticates it and then associates to it. And now the bad actor is in control of both drones. Another type of attack is attacking geofences. So what's a geofence? A geofence, we know what a fence is, but a geofence is a method of keeping drones outside of no-fly areas. If you go on to YouTube and search for drones flying around airports, you're going to see that there's a lot of drones that are flying around airports, and airports are number one no-fly area for drones. But they're also not supposed to fly around stadiums, and you can find videos of that. They're not supposed to be flying around prisons. You can find videos of that. And so the geofence is meant to keep the drone from flying around those areas. So a geofence capable drone will compare its current location, that is through GPS, with a database of no-fly areas. If the drone gets close to a no-fly area, it will not proceed. It will just stop, just like if there was an actual physical fence there. The application of geofences are not without their faults. For example, a security researcher showed a few years ago that a DJI drone's geofence contained almost 11,000 entries. That is, all of those are no-fly areas. So what did he do? And so this is what geofences look like if you go to DJI's website. And this is the Washington, D.C. area, and it's showing some uh, no-fly areas, and it's also showing this is right around Ronald Reagan National Airport. And of course, this is going to be one big no-fly zone, particularly the fact that it's in Washington, D.C., very close to the White House. So what did this cybersecurity researcher do? He downloaded the database from the drone and started changing the geolocation entries. Once he did that, he uploaded the new database and after that, he was able to make his drone ignore the manufacturer set no-fly zones, and then he could fly when, wherever he pleased. So that sounds like it's difficult to do, but if you go online, there are dozens and dozens of different websites that explain exactly how to do this. Now, I would, I would encourage you not to do this. But just suffice to say that if you're ethical, you're not going to do this, but malicious actors, by their very name, are not ethical. They're malicious. So those were just a few of the threats to drones. In upcoming videos, we're going to sh show you that there are a lot more threats, but they're very specific to a particular types of drones. And so what did we learn? What did we discuss? The drones have many uses and are increasingly purchased by hobbyists and by business for commercial use and also by the government. And of course, they're used by the military, but normally military drones are different animals than these commercial off-the-shelf drones. If we looked at the components, and if you, if you don't consider the aeronautical hardware, then we've got a smartphone or a laptop, which just means that drones are flying computers. And we know that any computing device is susceptible to cyber attack. And so the attacks we discussed here, the first one was deauthentication. And that's only for drones that are using Wi-Fi for their communications. And we saw how easy it was to deauthenticate a drone. We discussed GPS spoofing and jamming, which can be used on these commercial drones. And we already know that they're being used by the military. That's a, an inherent part of electronic warfare that's been used since World War II and perhaps before. So we also discussed the man-in-the-middle attack which is more likely to occur when communications are not encrypted. And we also discussed that hijacking, which included that deauthentication and the man in the middle attack. And that was afforded through that Skyjack software. And finally, we talked about geofence spoofing. So there's three subsequent videos to this one. This is part one of three. In the next video, I'm going to be talking about some research that I conducted over the last couple of years, and that involves commercial off-the-shelf drones and being able to identify specific vulnerabilities for that, those particular drones. And second, 
I'm going to use that information and then I'm going to exploit it, that is, use that information to attack the drone. This video was brought to you by the National Cybersecurity Training and Education Center out of Whatcom Community College through a grant funded by the National Science Foundation.